Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Morrill. I'm a professor here and chair of academic programs. Um, and it's my great pleasure um, today to welcome Professor Lisa Imonen, who is professor of archaeology at the University of Turku in Finland. He's recently taken up this appointment, so um, congratulations indeed. Prior to this, he was assistant professor of cultural heritage studies at the University of Helsinki, um, and he's uh, also held a number of uh, prestigious fellowships. Uh, he was a visiting scholar at Stanford University, 2010 to 11, postdoctoral fellow at the Getty Research Institute in 2015 and 2016. Um, and of course, he's currently a research fellow here at the BGC um, between April and May. So we're very pleased to welcome you to our community. Um, Professor Monan's research focuses on medieval uh, material culture, especially uh, luxury consumption. His doctoral dissertation, which he received from the University of Turku, is entitled Golden Moments, Artifacts of Precious Metals as Products of Luxury Consumption in Finland, 1200 to 1600, um, was published in 2009. And since then, he's continued to combine archaeological and historical methods in articles including uh, such titles as Connecting Things Through the Visual Arts, Medieval Crescent Moon Pendants as Horse Ornaments, Norwegian Archaeological Review, 2013, and uh, the very uh, wonderfully suggestive title Fondling on the Kitchen Table, <laughs> Artifacts, Sexualities, and Performative Metaphors in the 15th to 17th centuries. Journal of Social Archaeology, uh, 2014. Um, previous funded research projects that he has uh, led include the spatial organization of the medieval Dominican convent at Turku in 2015, um, the Middle Ages in your mobile phone, which is a, um, perhaps you can explain a little yeah. uh, in, in your talk, but an app basically uh, to introduce the medieval city of Turku. Uh, to visitors, um, and the 13th century Episcopal See of Koroinen in Turku and the culture of Christianity in Finland, uh, which uh, he began in 2010. And as the mobile app phone uh, project suggests, in addition to medieval studies, Imonen has been engaged in cultural heritage studies and has recently published a monograph on the development of Finnish cultural heritage legislation and administration during the 20th century. He's also discussed uh, issues related to cultural heritage in articles such as, uh, again, uh, Quidditching and the emergence of new heritage identities, amateur metal detecting in Finland, uh, published this year, and photographic, photographic bodies and biographical narratives, the Finnish state archeologist, Johanni Rinner in pictures. Um, but uh, at the Bar Graduate Center, he will be completing a book project on the scientific analyses conducted on medieval relics and reliquaries across Europe, um, entitled The Art and Science of Sacred Materiality, Late Medieval Relics and Reliquaries in Europe as Art Historical Objects. Um, and so it's, it's a wonderful uh, uh, project, particularly for, for our institution, engage as we are in trying to marry uh, um, material science with the humanities. Um, so his talk today is entitled um, Folding and Wrapping the Sacred, Living with Late Medieval Relics and Reliquaries in Europe. Please welcome Professor Imanen. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I might add one publication that came out last year uh, it's in Finnish, but it's about animals and humans in ancient Finnish artifacts, and it was made uh, in collaboration with the um, Finnish photographer specialist in fashion photography, and he made photographs of ancient artifacts, and we wrote uh, mini essays on them. And as, as you can see, uh, when you work in a small community of scholars, like in Finland, you have to do all kinds of things. Uh, ranging from metal detecting to uh, medieval relics. And 
Today I will be talking about relics more. Um, Sunday, August the 1st, 1489, was the day of St. Catherine of Vatstena's translation or the transfer of her holy bones in Vatstena Abbey in Sweden. St. Catherine was the daughter of St. Bridget of Sweden and they both lived in the 14th century. After high mass, celebrated by the archbishop early in the morning, Catherine's grave was op opened in the central aisle of the church near the high altar. Catherine's bones were to be moved from a grave in the abbey church and placed into reliquaries housed in the church. Clergymen and honorable guests were gathered around the tombstone and bent on their knees. The archbishop approached the grave, but the two brothers loosened the grave stone and lowered it. The archbishop put out the coffin with St. Catherine's bones. He then opened the coffin and removed the silk that shrouded the bones. The archbishop elevated the saint's head and let bishops and other closest guests to do the same. He proceeded to place the cranium into a casket and did the same with mandible or jawbone, setting it into a vessel, and then placed arm bones into a casket. The bishops moved the vessels to the high altar. Finally, these reliquaries, along with St. Bridget's casket, were carried in a procession around the church and the churchyard. Um, the translation of Catherine's bones, although an impressive and rare event in the Nordic countries, what not, was not unusual in medieval Europe. Its importance, however, is in the detailed contemporary description of the event, and the fact that several bones attributed to both Catherine and Bridget have survived today, until today. Recently, they were subjected to modern osteological and dating studies. Anthropological and DNA investigation showed that the, both skulls are from females. However, the radiocarbon dating revealed the first skull is from the 13th century, while the second was uh, from after 1470. These periods do not coincide with the time of the saints when they lived. Moreover, mitochondrial DNA results showed that the skulls were not from maternally related individuals. <laughs> The story of Catherine's relics and their reliquaries lays out nicely the context of my work. I'm interested in the European late medieval cult of relics, or rather its material phrases, that is, the relics and the containers. I focus on their materials and construction. Um, a considerable number of scientific studies have been done on relic assemblages across Europe. In 2016, the first international workshop, Relics at the Lab, on, on the scientific study of European relics was organized in Brussels. And the workshop papers included several Finnish contributions related to a project launched in 2007. That project studies the medieval relics of Turku Cathedral in Finland. This collection of 90 wrapped relics comprises bone, wood, textiles and other materials, but no metallic containers. They were melted down during the Reformation. These remains are investigated with a spectrum of scientific methods. Samples are taken not only for radiocarbon dating, but also for uh, fiber and pigment studies, while bones are examined by osteo osteoarchaeologists and subjected to DNA and isotopic analysis. Uh, despite their growing number and importance, the results of such scientific analyses have not had a full impact on the art historical study of cult of relics. There are no works that synthesize the available scientific material and articulate its larger implications for art history. Although the material qualities of relics and reliquaries are often referred to, and this is something I'm trying to do 
here at the pod as well. But I return to the story of St. Catherine's relics. Often the material study of the cult of relics is dominated by the study of metallic reliquaries. And after the introduction of new scientific means of human remains as well. And these two elements are mentioned in the account of the translation of St. Catherine's relics too. However, the account also refers to something that's between these two elements, the silk that covered the bones and was removed by the archbishop before elevating the bones. Textile coverings and wrappings have an interesting position between the sacred remains and the containers in which the wrapped relics were stored. And in today's paper, I will focus on these in-between items and ask how wrappings functioned in the cult of relics. A number of modern studies on the materials and techniques used in creating reliquaries allow to reconstruct the elab elaborate acts of wrapping and unwrapping in detail. And I will argue that wrapping had a more complex role than often acknowledged. The meanings and sy symbolisms of wrappings resonated with the practices related to dead bodies as well as living bodies. Um, I will start with some remarks on wrapping as a cultural practice. It's a topic that has attracted a lot of attention, especially in anthropology. I've chosen four essential points from this, these theoretical discussions. Wrapping establishes a relationship between the materials used for covering or enclosing and the content inside them. A wrapper or layers of wrappers can be soft like textile or paper or hard like metal and wood. And thus, in broad sense, reliquaries in their entirety are devices of wrapping. Wrapping objects act on their contents by affecting the accessibility and perception of what's inside. This way, a wrapper or layers of wrappers, wrappers form a bond between the inside and outside. They as establish boundaries to create interfaces between objects, subjects, and the environment. Importantly, this bond remains periodical since wrapping can always be removed, unwrapped. Clothing is a means of wrapping the human body, whereas tattoos are, no, are not exactly wrappings. Tattoos are envelop the body but can't be removed. The acts of wrapping and unwrapping in certain cultural contexts have heightened signific significance. And this is based on the relationship between, on the one hand, wrapping as the application of material layers that can be removed, and on the other hand, the metaphorical and metaphysical forms of wrapping. The combination of concrete and metaphorical wrapping is particularly significant with the late medieval cult of relics, where the fragments of holy persons formed complex spiritual and material entities. And this is my first point. Wrapping covers many kinds of human objects, from relic coverings to reliquaries and clothing used by living people, and they can be metaphorically connected to each other. Secondly, the anthropologist Alfred Gales, uh, Alfred Gales argues that wrapping is a device to both protect and control sacred powers. Um, Gale has studied decorations of the body as a form of wrapping in Polynesia. And they prese present or represent a social skin that simultaneously acts to contain the contagious sacredness of the body rather than simply constituting a technique for presenting the body from the potentially harmful effects of spiritual forces beyond human control, wrapping constitutes uh, the visible front line in this ongoing battle. Um, the anthropologist Valerio Valeri, discussing ancient Hawaii, analyzes how objects were considered to be manifestation of gods. They were wrapped in bark clothes, at time of consecration, manifesting God's presence in the objects. 
the practice of wrapping meant the movement from visible into the God's invisible presence, from a thing of perception to the thing of the mind. Thirdly, following the sem semiotician Massimo Leone, uh, I consider wrapping a device in establishing narrativity into objects. At its simplest, this means that the wrapper implies that it has been wrapped around an object at some point in the past, but it can always be removed in the future. And this is a very simple narrative. Leon, Leone underscores the significance of wrapping in representing the supernatural or transcendence. And transcendence is connected with uh, narrativity. Leone argues that wrapping creates a dynamics between the one doing the wrapping, aiming at distancing the observer from the encapsulated entity, and the encapsulated entity, which without the wrapper would be another kind of, would made another kind of impression on the observer. And thirdly, the observer implied in the act of wrapping. And this triangle creates a narrative where the observer is provided with the desire to see the thing wrapped. Fourthly, I turn to some archaeological insights. One of the basic observations of ancient wrapping in archaeology has been that the evidence for wrapping is often complex, partial, and fragmentary. Moreover, archaeologists are increasingly moving beyond simply wishing to preserve the wrapped artifacts. Instead, they have come to recognize that the layers, wraps, and rolls are as important as means to understand the complexity of the past material culture as the objects themselves. And this has relevance uh, for the conservation of reliquaries and relics, which, which conduct, when conducted carefully, can reveal their intricate histories. And next, I will discuss the use of wrappings in medieval relics and reliquaries in general terms. Medieval relics, usually human bones or other parts of the human body, or items that were in contact with the holy persons, were commonly wrapped in linen, silk, or other textiles before they were deposited in, a, in the reliquary container. But what were the reasons for wrapping these items? Partly wrapping was, of course, a practical way of keeping the sainted remains together and protect them from wear and tear. Wrapping was also dictated by the Fourth Lateran Council held in 1215 which decreed that relics were not to be displayed outside their containers. As holy, con as holy entities, relics were not to be touched with their hands, following the intangible nature of the divine. In some churches, special cloths or napkins could be used in handling relics. And even if, if it was necessary to touch the remains, access to them was highly restricted. At the frapping, tying and sealing relics in pouches was part of, of a series of rituals restricted to the clergy. In addition to these practical considerations, wrapping has a highly sim was a highly symbolic act. According to, to the Book of Revelation, on the Day of Judgment, the martyrs are given white robes to wear as a sign of the purity of their souls and white robes were given unto every one of them, says the Bible. And this scriptural reference continues to, to be remembered throughout the medieval period. In medieval exe exegesis, the white robes were associated with the blissful state that the souls of the elect will achieve after death. They were a symbol of spiritual beauty and uh, presented the remains of a body wrapped it in, in white linen as heavenly, uh, heavenly presence. Martina Bagnoli distinguishes between the bones of saints wrapped and concealed from corpses of the ordinary humans which were left exposed, naked. After death, 
bodies of the deceased were washed and wrapped into shrouds, perhaps put in a, put in a coffin for transportation, but eventually low, lowered into the grave naked without shrouds. Hence, although Pagnoli points out the possible association between the shrouds of the ordinary bodies and the relic wrappings, she emphasizes the scriptural interpretation. The Bible reference is important, no doubt, but I would argue that the association to, to the shrouds of the dead is still important. The shrouds might have been removed when the <coughs> ordinary body was put into the grave, but that only brings out the, particularly, the particular in-between state of wrapped relics. They were entities somewhere between living people and the bodies laid into the grave. Relics were, were the earthly remains of holy persons, but at the same time, a connection to the heavenly presence. Whether the reliquary containers of metal allowed seeing the relics inside them or not, the relics were almost always wrapped up in little pouches. Often these coverings were cut from discarded church hangings or litur liturgical vestments. In fact, most of the surviving textiles from the medieval period were at some point used as wrapping material for relics. After the relic was deposited inside the cloth, the wrapping was secured by stitches or strings. There were some commonalities in relic, relics, relic wrappings. One piece of textile folded around the relic was enough, but frequently relics were wrapped in several layers of fabrics. They were wrapped and rewrapped, and new layers could be added when the reliquary was opened to obtain a relic, to insert a new relic, or to authenticate the contents. <coughs> Typically, the first layer was fine white linen, while the subsequent layers were more sumptuous textiles like silk. The, the use of white linen closes to the relic as a reference to the robes of saints in the book of Revelations, in the book of Revelation. Um, in addition, placing the relics underneath several layers of other textiles can also be seen as a reference to the way in which textiles were organized on living people. Body linen, body linen acted, acted as undergarments, while other textiles covering linen were visually more prominent. The choice of silk as the typical fabric for, for wrapping was motivated by its sheer monetary value and the striking visual characteristics of silk. It was the most luxurious fabric available to the medieval aristocracy and the church. Interestingly, Paul A. Brasinski and Allegra R.P. Frixel point out that like cloth and wool, Silk is generally scentless, but the purple dyes used to color it had a potent smell. Silk would have had a strong mollusk aroma that abated over time. Brasinski and Frixel suggest that this might have contributed, in addition to incense and other scented materials, to the sweet scent of sanctity that relics reportedly secreted. Besides linen and silk, parchment was occasionally used as wrapping material as well. In the Middle Ages, sacred text on parchment functioned as a metaphor of the mystery of the incarnation, the word made flesh. There was a potent association between parchment and the body of Christ. Slips of parchment called authentique or sedule had a particular use in reliquaries. They were stitched to the fabric, and the name of the saint or the relic was written on the slip. The parchment provided the authentic identity of the contents in writing. <coughs> Interestingly, even if the relic itself for, was lost for some reason, 
his authentication slips were still kept and collected in churches. They were appreciated in themselves. Moreover, the parchment slip was frequently wrapped around the relic as a textile. The close connection between relics and wrappings is shown also by the relic status of shrouds or dresses that had touched saints. Famous examples are the veil of Saint Veronica, a cloth bearing the actual appearance of Christ at Passion, and the shroud of Turin with the impression of Christ's whole body. Other examples are the tunic believed to have been worn by Saint Francis of Assisi, preserved in the church of Saint Francis in Cortona, and the patched mantle of St. Bridget of Sweden, made from an old dress and dressed in Santa Brigida, a Campo de Fiori in Rome. After this broader consideration on relic wrappings, I will now move on to two examples on the complexity of textiles and threads used in covering saintly remains. Both examples are from the Turku material. Recently, scholars have shown particular interest in the long histories of reliquaries of metal and other hard materials. Often, close analyses reveal several amendments and alterations taking place during the Middle Ages after they were originally produced. Bits of old reliquaries were also reused in making of newer ones. And my both examples evince similar temporal complexity in softer wrappings in textiles. The first case study is a semi-spherical reliquary composed of several layers of fab fabrics at Turku Cathedral. The measurements of the reliquary are about 14 centimeters by 14 centimeters by 8 centimeters. The reliquary and relics inside inside it don't have any parchment slips to identify the remains. Scholars previously thought that the relic to, was uh, the relic to be St. Bridget of Sweden's cap. The reliquary was recently opened, examined, and conserved by the conservator Mira Kartila. The reliquary is decorated with a two, two-colored table-woven band and two white crossing bands with narrow metal coated leather strips. On the table woven band there are four rectangular leather pieces metal, with metal thread embroidery. The embroideries resemble decorative filigree work which was in fashion for example in the 14th century the reliquaries of precious metals. Cartilla discovered that the reliquary consists of four coverings. The innermost is linen, and is followed by a layer of nettle fabric and two layers of silk. Under these layers, there was a fragment of dress with triangular inserted gore, and many pieces of bone, each of which was wrapped in a piece of bast fiber cloth. The small relic packages may have originally been sewn together to resemble a calot or a skull. Inner silk number two, covering the re reliquary, is mounted in place using some, some pleats and a seam which connects the short edges of the fabric. Silk number one has a seam running across it and, it, and the edges are fragmentary, suggesting reuse of textile. Um, but it's apparent that the silks are very simple in weaving technique and certainly not the most expensive ones available at that time. Nonetheless, these lower grade fabrics ha still had an the important feature of silk, the fabulous sign. On the basis of radiocarbon datings, the making of the reliquary took place at the end of the 13th century. However, the materials are probably recycled and reused, and at least some of the decorative bands are somewhat later additions. The oldest ra radiocarbon dates of the bones are from the 2nd and the 4th century AD. 
Cartilla suggests that the reliquary might belong to the cult of Saint Ursula and her 11,000 virgins. The cult spread from Cologne throughout Europe from the 12th century onwards. The bones of Saint Ursula and the virgins were found and collected from a vast cemetery dating back to the Roman times, which could uh, fit with the radiocarbon dating of the, of, of the bones in this reliquary. The Cistercian Abbey of Herkenrode in Belgium hosts 47 silk covered skull, uh, skulls associated with Saint Ursula and her companions, which were studied and conserved recently. And in these cases, individual, individual text, textile wrapped bones have been sewn together to create a skull like structure. My other case study is the skull reliquary at Turku. It was earlier identified as uh, Saint Eric of Sweden, the saintly king, or Saint Henry of Finland, the bishop who converted uh, Finns in the early medieval period. But presently the attribution is considered unknown. The conservator Aki Arponen, osteologist Heli Majanen and I are about to publish an article about this reliquary. The skull relic with red silk damask is slightly smaller in size than an average cranium, human cranium. And it can be divided into two elements, a textile reliquary and, a, and an artificial skull structure. The textile reliquary consists of three layers of fabric. The innermost layer is made of linen, whereas the outer layers are silk. And the topmost silk is a red Chinese damask cloth. It is decorated with the depiction of a martyrdom embroidered with silk and metal threads. On the basis of radiocarbon datings, uh, the thread in the embroidery was made at the turn of the 13th and 14th centuries. The silk, in turn, is from the period between 1220 and 1310. The skull relic consists of bones deposited in linen packages. They have been sewn together with a thread of linen. The largest bones are placed uh, to some measure into the same locations as they would have been in a real human cranium. The structure is so densely packed that no additional material support was needed. In the skull relic, there are some materials which are younger younger than the silk in the Chinese damask. They include portions of linen uh, in the skull structure and some fabric covers. And uh, in the front, there are some green silk braid, braids uh, dating to uh, 13th and 14th centuries. And it seems on the basis of silks and threads that the assembling of the skull took place around the mid 14th century. Inside the skull construction, there, are, there were 19 linen pouches with bones and a few pieces of linen cloth, which were probably remains of empty bone packages. Most of the packages contained only one bone or, or a fragment, while five of them had several fragments. One of the one of the pouches contained over 40 small pieces of bone. And these bone fragments can be divided into three groups, cranial bones, postcranial bones, and unidentified bones. And some of these un unidentified bones can be animal bones, not human. The radiocarbon dates of the bones range uh, from the, from 550 BC to 1220 AD. So it's a quite uh, wide chronological uh, stretch. Anyway, the two reliquaries of Turku reveal the intricate relationship between relics and wrappings in the Middle Ages. In the skull reliquary, uh, the bone fragments were wrapped into linen pouches stitched together with threads 
and then small pouches were deposited inside layers of cloth. It is apparent that the function of wrappings was more than just to protect the bones. They organized the whole <coughs> remains into a form recognizable as a human skull. And in this talk, I have drawn on anthropological and archaeological theories on wrapping and unwrapping. And I listed four components important in approaching the wrapping of medieval relics. My last or fourth point was the significance of the archaeological approach when analyzing the fragments and the material details. And I hope that the two cases, case studies demonstrate, demonstrate the value of combining conservation with cultural analysis in scrutinizing material evidence. And this allows understanding the cult of relics as a material practice in, in a nuanced manner. My third point was the narrative character of wrapping relics. The written account on the, on the translation of St. Catherine's relics in 1489 describes in detail how the archbishop pulled out the coffin and opened it. Then he proceeded to remove shrouds around the bones and the textile is specified to be silk. So it has a narrative function in this uh, um, account. Moreover, the relic wrappings themselves provide a material narrative of adding layers of cloth and threads in different times. My two case studies show that the study of wrapping could, should not focus solely on the moment when the relics were acquired and deposited in reliquaries. Instead, the investigation has to take into consideration the long history of material changes that the wrappings have experienced. Finally, in both examples, the wrappings provided the shape and recognizability to the relics inside, a perceptual narrative, if you will. My second point focused on Gail's idea that wrapping is a device to both protect and control sacred powers. In the Middle Ages, only the clergymen had the authority to wrap and un unwrap relics from their layers of textile. In addition, the wrappings not only framed, but to some extent also constructed the relics inside them to be viewed. The issue of control and presentation is connected with my first point, stating that wrapping connects metaphorically many kinds of objects, from relic coverings to reliquaries and clothing used by living people. Covering relics with li white linen has a scriptural basis, and as wrapping, wrapping relics created a visual metaphor pointing to the lives of the blessed in their heavenly dwelling. Layering relics with linen and silk can also be associated with the, with the litur liturgical garments the clergy wore, and even the dress used by lay people. The white linen also reminded the of the shrouds of the dead. Medieval wrappings made sure that relics were mostly hidden from the naked eye, even when, the sh when shown in transparent reliquaries. They, their objecthood was absolved by wrappings and lifted to the level of invisible transcendence. The wrappings functioned as in-between entities connecting the relics and the devotee, at the same time regulating the relations between the inside and the outside. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for a very thought-provoking, very interesting um, area. Um, the floor is open for questions. Uh, 
many of the um, practices related to cult of relics in the Middle Ages uh, are directly uh, descending from the Roman way of burial. So it, there's a clear connection between uh, the Roman and even prehistoric ways of uh, um, wrapping the dead before laying them into the grave. So there is a, there is a continuity, but the problem is that it's so common in prehistoric times to wrap bodies up that it's very difficult to point out what exactly was the tradition in this case that they continued. Is there just one last question? Yeah. Is there a, a converse? Were bodies in tombs but not wrapped in early, early times? Oh, um, sure. Yeah, sure. There were there are a lot of examples also of bodies not wrapped uh, in tombs and if even in the Middle Ages, the practices are quite um, varied regarding the uh, ordinary bodies. Some of them were wrapped, some of them were not. So uh, um, it's a kind of simplification to say how the body was treated because there were a lot of practices even in the Middle Ages. But the main practice was to wrap it in, in the shrouds. Such an interesting talk. Um, a question about the relation. Well, it, it, it's I'm growing out of the um, Massimo Leone and mm -hmm. narrativity, and also thinking about um, the movement of of, of these relics mm -hmm. through theft and other um, mm -hmm. <laughs> processes, and wondering if there's a connection then between wrapping and place or displacement. Were things wrapped to indicate? where they were from, or as a sort of claim to them, or is there any way in which there's a sort of locative or geographic aspect to wrapping? Um, well, I had these examples of, of the cult of St. <coughs> Ursula, and mm -hmm. they are very clearly uh, fabric-focused, mm -hmm. these relics. While there are some relics and relic bodies that have only the minimum of cloth, just the one wrapping and that's it. So they are clearly uh, different kind of tradition and geographical locations <coughs> with different kind of traditions, but so far it's so, um, we haven't studied it enough to point out what are the different regional differences. But, but on if we have a relic, relic or reliquary with textile wrapping, uh, it, it's impossible to say only by that where it is from. I guess I was sort of thinking like someone rewrapped to sort of assert, ah. you know, now we've got it here, if it becomes mm. a part of a device of making a claim to a relic. Yeah, there are examples of that, uh, that the, the old wrappings are kept, but new layers added in, in different place <laughs> and the, after the translation of the relic. So there is kind of uh, building up the history mm -hmm. with the relic, with the fabrics. Mm -hmm. So there is clearly that. Um, a couple of things. You're carrying the area of medieval, late medieval. Yeah. Most of this stuff goes back, way, way yeah. back. Yeah. And uh, it's reminded me of the, uh, still to this day, an Orthodox Jewish mm -hmm. the washing of the body and covering it. Yeah. You know. So this covered from some far back to school. But also it reminded me of, um, there's a Muslim word which means the blessedness that attaches itself to building objects after many years of loving use, very close to the word Baruch in Hebrew. So how, how does that fit into the fact that this bone or this part of human being or this part of clothing that was worn for years and years and years has a sacred or blessed you know, idea of what goes into the package? 
Uh, there was a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first about my focus on, on the late Middle Ages. And that's, that springs partly from the fact that presently a lot of studies focus on early medieval stuff, while the late medieval stuff is considered more stereotypical and mass produced. But that's exactly what I'm interested in. These kind of St. Ursula cloths and relics, which are mass produced and spread out throughout Europe. So uh, I'm interested in the stereotypical and the repetition of tradition. <coughs> and I think in the late medi medieval stuff, you can also see kind of understanding that these old reliquaries and relics have a history when the clergymen open them and see that different kind of textiles and uh, materials. And I'm interested to see if there is kind of historical consciousness when they treat these uh, objects or not. I'm not yet in the, in the point to say whether it was like that or not, but I'm interested in that. Thank you. Um, I have a question and in a way it goes back to Elizabeth's point in a, in a slightly different way. Um, so I take your point, uh, number one, that wrapping is in a kind of semantic continuum mm -hmm. with other kinds of covering, mm -hmm. um, especially in these contexts, covering by textiles. Yeah. But my sense is that your points two and three are amplified by thinking about what's unique about wrapping as opposed to other kinds of covering. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the sense that I, the sense that I have is like even clothing, um, clothing that's wrap, wrapped, mm -hmm. uh, thinking like a sari or something, um, it not only covers but it restricts movement, yeah. maybe even strategically. And I'm thinking about this gel sense of that wrapping has a kind of protective function. Um, and I wonder whether a couple of your examples are wrapped or just covered, mm -hmm. and what the difference might be for thinking about the, the nature of wrapping. And um, it seems to me that while wrapping, wrapping unlike other kinds of covering, um, restricts the movement of the thing that's wrapped, it also results from an increase of movement by the person doing the covering. That wrapping is repetitive, it's sequential, it's yeah. overlapping um, in a way that just covering isn't. And so mm -hmm. on the one hand, there's sort of more movement by people, there's less yeah. movement by the thing that's contained. Maybe there's an intention to keep the thing from circulating mm -hmm. um, locally or or beyond, and so I just wonder if I could push you a little bit to think yeah, about yeah. what's unique about wrapping that makes it work for those who wrap things or unwrap them. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in my in my work, I think the most interesting thing about wrapping is kind of um, repetition of wrapping, Wra wrapping things again and again and again, kind of accumulating the history of the object by wrapping it again. And that's quite unique with relics con compared with uh, human dress or just covering things up. So I would say that it's a repetition that interests me, in, like the mass production in general. But in this case of wrapping, it's um, layering things again and again. That's the unique thing about uh, these relics and reliquaries. And Basically, you wouldn't need many layers of fab fabric if you considered it from just from practical point of view. Only one layer would do it, but they still put another and another there. And that's something I'm quite interested about. Oh yes, I just wanted to remark uh, that Pope John at the end of the last century debunked uh, a handful of saints, of which there are tons of relics around, including St. Christopher, St. George, St. Margaret, St. Catherine, etc. How uh, do you confront that fact, or the people that own these relics confront mm -hmm. that fact, in terms of wrapping to preserve power, for example, 
uh, is, is the power lost when a saint is debunked? Uh, are they still displaying uh, the garment of Saint Christopher in whatever church it was that had it when the existence of Saint Christopher was debunked? Yeah. And also I should point out for those interested in the relic of the true cross that the feast day of Helena's discovery of the true cross was also removed from the liturgy. Uh, wow. That used to be celebrated on May 3rd, so that's a former feast day in the Roman uh, liturgy. Uh, and the reason that was debunked, and they give the reasons, was that there simply isn't, contrary to what many people believe, any historical evidence to support that, uh, and that there's considerable uh, evidence to support the fact that you did not find it, namely the fact that Eusebius in his ecclesiastical history mentions that Helena went to the Holy Land, restored some churches, and not a word about the discovery of the true cross. So when you deal with these relics, uh, I assume that if they were thought to be real, you would handle them in a certain way because there's something sacred, something powerful there. Well, when the very saint whose relics these are are defunct, yeah. does this have some effect on how people see these things, how they venerate them, and how they're handled, and how they're rewrapped? Uh, and I'm not sure that rewrapping is quite uh, as big a deal as we seem to be making it here. Uh, we have uh, relics in, in the Savile Triptych and Morgan Library. Those were wrapped, they were put into the triptych, and they weren't rewrapped for another thousand years. So not everything is wrapped and rewrapped. So how this affects the person who's doing it might be a bit o uh, overplayed and what effect it has on. Because it's a thing that happens once and doesn't affect anybody else except the person who's sort of looking at the relic and making sure it's properly wrapped. Yeah. Well, anyway, there are a couple questions there. <laughs> but I'd be most interested in the ones that relate to uh, the popes uh, really debunking of quite a number of these things and what impact that has on the way people view the relics uh, and relic words today. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I start with the uh, fact that some many relics were only wrapped once, and that's it. Uh, and that's true. Uh, definitely many relics were wrapped only once, and that's it. Nobody touched them for hundreds of years. Uh, and, uh, and that's interesting also, why weren't certain relics re-wrapped? while others were. And for example, if I take these, take this, this uh, construction of uh, St. Ursula, uh, I'm wondering whether this was wrapped uh, like this originally, or, or are these um, later wrappings, or uh, what was the actual date when this thing was constructed? And, and I would argue that uh, because of this complexity, they are interesting and I'm interested in them for that reason. Although the, you have to keep in mind that some relics were wrapped only once and that's it. And, and the same goes with. Uh, for example, with shrouds in which uh, people were wrapped when they died. Because uh, although there is this argument that many bodies were buried naked, there are also a lot of examples of people buried in their shrouds. Again, this, in, in this kind of stuff or material, it's very difficult to make uh, generalizations that would apply in every case. Very medieval in that sense. There's always exceptions, uh, and then about the debunking of uh, relics. Uh, actually, we had a uh, kind of contrary situation with, with the Turku material because allegedly in this material there are relics of Beatus Hemmingus, uh, a Finnish uh, 14th-century bishop, and. They haven't been identified yet because we have a lot of bones without any identification. But the Catholic Church in Finland contacted us and wanted to know if we have scientifically proved that one of those bones belonged to 
compared to semi-nuls because they want to elevate him in the status of a real saint. So actually they were uh, counting on our ability to authenticate mm -hmm. these poles. And that's kind of reverse of debunking. Uh, and it's, it, it's a very in interesting case of authentication. But in the Middle Ages, people were very interested in authenticity of these relics, and they considered that a lot. And the when the Reformation came, um, many reformators just continued this debate that whether they are authentic or not. And uh, in that sense, debunking isn't uh, mm -hmm. that new thing. It's, it, it has been considered since the Middle Ages. And, uh, but it's very revealing that this, the collection at Turku Cathedral, which is nowadays a uh, Lutheran church, uh, they still kept these bones and relics, although the Lutheran faith doesn't uh, recognize saints or at, at, at least relics in, in the same way as the Catholics. But they were considered to be part of the history of the cathedral in the 16th century, and they were kept still, although they, were, they didn't have any Mm, spiritual content in the Lutheran church. So there is kind of also this kind of respect for history in many cases, although the saint was debunked. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing wrapping as yeah. a part of the puzzle of looking at relic queries. Um, my question is just about the authentication slips. Mm -hmm. um, were they normally on parchment? And it seemed in some of your examples, you know, there were multiple fragments from multiple people over yeah. multiple centuries. And so um, today, like, where does one find, I mean, are they still in the in cathedrals? Are mm -hmm. they within reliquaries? Where does one find the extant parchment authentication mm -hmm. slips? And what was their function at the time? In uh, the slips were used precisely because you cannot say just from a bone who, who, who it belonged. So you needed some kind of assurance that it's identifiable. And uh, it, was, it was usually parchment. In, in early modern period, they could also be of paper, ordinary paper, but usually they were parchment, something that you could write on. And, uh, um, and then where would it be placed? Uh, it was soon on the silks or the whatever fabrics was, was the on that relic. It was soon on that. And in, in Turku material, you have cases that um, <coughs> the slip has uh, um, detached itself from the relic. And they have already used the middle edges as soon on them to the wrong relics. So it, we have a. Uh, finger relic of Saint Eric in our uh, collection with the slip saying that this is Saint uh, Eric's finger, but actually there's just black fabric inside, so they have um, reattached it incorrectly during the Middle Ages. Right. Um, you mentioned that you came across empty pouches. Mm -hmm. So would, that, would you hold that that implies that the wrapping or the pouches never really form an intrinsic, intrinsic or symbiotic relationship with the relic itself, or that the other, on the other hand, it, like a touch relic, maintains um, the significance of the relic that it creates in capital. Uh, with these empty, empty pouches, is the difficulty we don't know when they were empty. They might be just much might have been done in the modern period and not related to any uh, cult of relics as such, but just curious people opening them uh, in the sacristy of the church. Uh, but usually uh, these silks and the textiles, they could just be cut open if you wanted to see the relic or needed to see it. So it, the coverings uh, we are not uh, venerated as such. Again, there are a lot of exceptions that you have this uh, um, material that becomes sacred by, by touch, 
but there are also ca cases where it doesn't have that sanctity. And I'm not sure entirely when, it, when the case is that is, it is sacred and when the case is it, it, it isn't. So I'm not, I don't have a clear answer uh, how symbiotic the uh, relationship was. story on, on textiles or wrapping mm -hmm. in, in Northern Europe, especially in Finland, based on examples. But knowing a little bit the literature, it seems similar to other stories in other parts of Europe. You find the same stories in Spain, in Bari, in Sicily, in uh, you know, France, England, etc., etc., etc. And to what extent we can actually talk about a pan-Christian, pan-European story that doesn't have local differences between one case and the other, and to what extent you can actually find stories of localization. Yeah. Um, to what extent the Nordic story, or the Finnish story, if you will, is different from the Sicilian story? And where are the dangers in not finding these differences? Yeah. Um, uh, no, well, one thing is that uh, relics as commodities were spread or transported from one part of the world to another. Mm -hmm. so as material culture they are, they can be very homogeneous mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, but there are differences in practice, I would argue. That for example, in this story about St. Catherine's bones, uh, the archbishop, he touches the relic, the bones himself, whereas we have European churches where they had these napkins or cloths that they were used when touching the bones. So there are, I would say the differences are more in the side of practice than in these pieces of material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, I think our time is up. Um, <laughs> I was preempted in thanking Professor Lund for a very stimulating, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.